Well, governments all over the world are talking about innovation, and in particular how it's the engine of future prosperity. And there's no doubt that they're right. The most innovative economies are undoubtedly the most sustainable. Governments are also looking at the millions of dollars that they spend on universities and asking questions about the role of universities in the innovation ecosystem. Again, they're right to do so. Universities at their best have been crucibles of new ideas, places where human understanding is developed, where new technologies emerge, and where our most intellectually able citizens get a start. Moreover, the economic contribution of universities can't be underestimated. A recent report by Deloitte Access Economics has demonstrated that the Australian higher education sector contributed about $25 billion to the Australian economy, both directly and indirectly in 2013, accounting for over 1.5% of Australia's GDP. So politicians and policymakers are right to hunger for innovation and right again to assume that universities have a role in fostering it. But governments have been hostage to three simplistic and mistaken assumptions about how all that works. In particular, they've been hostage to three mistaken assumptions about the nature of university industry engagement, and in particular, about the role of industry in funding university research. The first assumption is that the new ideas being generated in universities are an endless source of potential licensing revenue to support the higher, re higher education system through the commercialization of research. It's said that industry is longing to realize the potential of technologies developed in university if only the universities would adequately protect their in innovation through intellectual properties and license it appropriately. But in a concerted push in several countries for the commercialization of university research, at least since the US Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, has uncovered no treasure trove to meet the spiraling cost of research in universities. A recent survey concludes that the financial importance of technology transfer to universities in the US, Europe, Japan and Australia is remarkably similar, and that on average technology transfer offices are profitable, albeit marginally, and that the licensing revenues are typically less than 5% of university research expenditures. Equally importantly, the survey found that the distribution of financial returns from technology transfer to universities in the form of licensing revenue is highly skewed. A few universities earn the majority of licensing revenues, while many earn very little and a significant proportion operate their tech transfer offices at a loss. The second mistaken assumption that governments make regarding the relationships between universities and industry is that if not licensing revenues, direct funding from industrial partnerships is a source of revenue for innovation, for res uh, for innovation research in universities. But take Stanford, heart of the extraordinary innovation ecosystem of California's Silicon Valley, in 2013, over 80% of Stanford's research funding came from the federal government, and only roughly 16% from non-government sources, of which direct funding from industry is only a part, alongside sources of funding such as the large US charitable foundations. It's a similar ratio, actually a bit closer to 10 to 1, at other research powerhouses in California, such as UC San Diego and UC Berkeley. Globally, the average for similar research-intensive universities is close to 11%. In 2013, we at the University of Sydney attracted around $55 million of equivalent non-government research funding, among the highest in Australia, which was approximately 13% of our total research funding revenue that year. So just as licensing is not likely to be a replacement for the public funding of research in universities, nor is industrial investment. Finally, the third mistaken assumption that's often made in this area is that only translational or applied research is central to innovation, and that the problem with universities is that they're obsessed with publicly funded basic research for the purposes of publication in learned journals and uninterested in translational or applied research. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
one of the most exciting current developments at the University of Sydney, for example, is the way in which we're now partnering with our local health system to develop research projects that address much more specifically the needs of our local health providers as they serve local community. It's an example of the community setting the research agenda and of our researchers responding to very real local research innovation needs. Similarly, we've signed an agreement with the town council of a regional community, Broken Hill. The community has agreed to be a place in which our students have the opportunity to take on placements and community-based study. In return, we've agreed that we'll undertake research on issues of interest to the local community and feed back the research of that res results of that research to the community in practical suggestions for change. In this way, the community becomes not just the object of our research, but a participant in shaping research and comes to see the value of the university's work. The project's already led to some first-rate research in highly ranked journals, but it began with a focus on local needs and with a commitment to engaging with the problems of the community that we serve. But while this very translational or applied research is important to universities everywhere, we cannot forget that our distinctive place as universities is right at the beginning, right at the beginning of the innovation chain, in the place of intellectual inquiry in which industry has little incentive to invest because it cannot immediately see the commercial possibilities. But this basic research is the seedbed of innovation. Let me again give two examples from the University of Sydney. It was at my research that the basic science that gave rise to Wi-Fi technology was developed. But it was developed not as a project in improving the then, improving the then non-existent internet, but as a project in radio astrophysics, curiosity-driven research about exploring the furthest reaches of the universe. Similarly, the director of the Charles Perkins Center, a project worth well over half a billion dollars in finding multidisciplinary solutions to the global e epidemic of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, Professor Steve Simpson, is an etymologist whose groundbreaking work in the physiology of the metabolic diseases began life as curiosity-driven research, attempting to understand why locusts, who are usually solitary creatures, swarm under certain conditions. Universities contribute to innovation not only when they undertake translational or applied research, but also when they undertake curiosity-driven basic research, when they inhabit their distinctive place in the innovation chain. The research work of a truly innovative institution demonstrates a, a balance between basic and applied and between discipline-driven research the research that emerges as a solution to the next question in the development of a particular discipline, and problem-driven research, which is always almost multidisciplinary. So it turns out that the relationship between universities and industry, and the role of universities in the innovation system, is much more complex than governments or policymakers usually assume. At the University of Sydney, we believe that the main purpose of engagement between universities and industry, and by this we mean industry broadly understood to include, for example, the not-for-profit sector, is fundamentally about capacity building. It's fundamentally about capacity building. It involves not only our research work in both basic and applied fields, but also our educational work in producing learners who are able to think entrepreneurially and are restless to experiment with new ideas. It involves not only our capacity to develop the traditional intellectual skills of our students and research trainees, but also our capacity to help them develop real-world problem-solving skills and to put them in touch with organisations outside the university who can benefit from their skills. Let me give two brief examples. The first is the Silicon Valley ecosystem, to which I've already referred, and the second is what we're doing at the University of Sydney. These are different industrial contexts, but there are some important shared insights in the richness and complexity and tremendous possibilities of greater university industry engagement. First, the Silicon Valley experience. Here's an excellent example of an ecosphere of innovation 
that's grown up around a virtuous circle of relationships between leading universities, technology companies, and the state and federal governments. Each feeds off and takes its lead from the other. At Stanford University, for example, outstanding undergraduates and postgraduates, even before they arrive, are primed to look for opportunities to translate their training and research into new ideas and technologies for the market. As students, they have access to an extraordinary range of alumni exemplars, um, exemplars, mentors, and professors who can share their experience and knowledge and advise them on their ideas. There are a multitude of programs, student internships, startups, accelerators, mentorship schemes that provide them with a chance to experiment and test their ideas and receive feedback from academic and industry experts. Because of the close engagement between the university and the local industry communi community, students enjoy extraordinary employment opportunities in the nearby Silicon Valley and Bay Areas. In fact, a recent study showed that more than a third of graduate engineers from Stanford University found jobs within 20 miles of the campus, and almost 40% of Stanford alumni have founded companies within 60 miles of the campus. And just because of their university experience, these graduates stay in close touch with their alma mater and thus in turn with their professors and mentors. This in turn helps inspire the next generation of students. Companies in particular come to value enormously the access they have to a regular pipeline of outstanding student and graduate talent. Californian business leaders often say that it's access and engagement with outstanding students and graduates that's perhaps the most valuable aspect of their relationship with universities such as Stanford, Ber um, um, Berkeley, UC San Diego, and other leading institutions, as much or on a par with the actual science and research those universities conduct. The university, universities, meanwhile, take advantage of the extraordinary innovation occurring all around them in local industry and draw on their close connection to those companies through their students and alumni translate those connections into future federal and state government research funding and grant income. One researcher into the California innovation system has called this aspect a kind of reverse tech transfer between industry and universities. Successful universities use their industry engagement to help gener generate more federal government research funding. Of course, many of the features of the Silicon Valley innovation in ecosystem are unique and are not replicable elsewhere. The invention of the silicon chip, semiconductor devices, and the growth of companies like HP, Cisco, Google, Facebook, and others is a product of a distinctive evolution and a combination of university and industry engagement. It would be foolish to try and simply replicate this particular high-tech ecosystem elsewhere. But the central lesson, the central lesson that the relationship is about capacity building and talent as well as ideas, and that it's an ecosystem of innovation that drives success rather than research funding flows, is an important lesson for governments and planners around the world. And now to Sydney. These reflections on the example of Silicon Valley and other successful innovation systems informs our approach to university collaboration with industry at the University of Sydney. As I said above, for us, it's fundamentally about capacity building, about disseminating our research, learning from industry, developing the talents of our students, and contribu contributing to our country and region's economic and social well-being. So how do you do industry and community engagement that builds capacity in this way? In short, you need to build long-term, sustainable, and dynamic relationships with companies and institutions that play to each other's strengths. The characteristics of these relationships when they're successful are not unlike those of any healthy human relationship. They're based on mutual respect, a willingness to learn from each other, and the ability to listen to the needs and understands the problems and challenges that each of you brings to the table. For universities, that means understanding the particular problem and challenges your industry partner is faced with, as well as the constraints that they face in addressing it. For industry, it means understanding what motivates and excites university researchers and finding ways to connect that expertise with the underlying ambitions of the company. There are challenges aplenty here. But let me try and illustrate this basic approach 
with some examples from our university. First, I want to reiterate that we believe that great innovation and transformative technologies come from great research. The extraordinary influence of universities such as Stanford, MIT, Cambridge and Imperial College on the innovation systems in the US and UK is driven by a deep commitment to research excellence. True innovation comes from groundbreaking research that quickly finds its way to industry and community partners who creatively and effectively realize the benefits for the broader community. That's why it's so important to continue to fund high quality research, whatever other new incentives and structures for university industry engagement we might want to put in place. Remaining true to what's sometimes called the founder DNA of an organization is crucial as well. We were founded in 1850 as a university that was intended to help contribute to the development of the then relatively young colony of New South Wales, as well as admit, albeit admittedly only male, students from whatever religious or cultural background they came, and among the first in the world to do so. We want to draw on this great tr tr um, tradition of innovation for the future. You might be interested to know that a research paper on the photoconductivity properties of selenium published in 1907 by Professor Oscar Ulrich um, von Villa from the University of Sydney provided the key technology for the subsequent in, 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 um, invention of the xerographic process in the United States by Chester Carson in 1937. The result was the photocopier. You might be interested to know it was at the University of Sydney that the black box flight recorder was invented or that the field of sleep medicine was established and the first masks to treat sleep disorders were invented. I could keep you here for hours with our tradition of innovation, which extends right back, as I've suggested, to the beginnings of the university. But one thing that we can learn from American industry, especially the technology sector, is the way that they've been particularly effective in taking advantage of this outstanding research and then translating it quickly into many of the transformative industries that will drive the 21st century economy of the future, machine learning, automated systems, the internet of everything. As a result, we're committed to finding new ways and mechanisms for work working more closely um, with industry in Australia and globally. And to return to my earlier comments, that means understanding our role in the ecosystem of innovation more generally. Let me give you a few examples of how we might do this. Mining and resources are a vital industry for Australia. Rio Tinto is a huge global player in this industry. Our relationship with Rio Tinto is a significant one and something we're keen to build on and learn from. The Rio Tinto Centre for Mine Automation, established at the university in 2007, came with an initial $21 million commitment from Rio and focuses on the development of autonomous, autonomous platforms to support Rio's mining operations. They were attracted by the outstanding research being conducted in our Faculty of Engineering and IT in robotics <coughs> and automated system. And the researchers, in turn, were excited and stimulated by the challenges and problems Rio brought to them for consideration. The fact that Rio's renewed funding for the centre twice in 2012 and again in 2014, with a contract now extending to 2019, is a testament to the success of, the, of, of our collaboration and the importance of sustaining long-term relationships. Our work with Rio has so far generated over 20 quality patents all of which are licensed by the company. Our collaboration with Qantas, an iconic Australian company of one of the largest of global airlines, is another example of high quality research attracting industry engagement. This now four year partnership is to research and develop novel optimization and trajectory planning techniques and has resulted in new flight planning software for Qantas that will enable the airline to fly better optimized routes, reduce fuel consumption and improve operational effectiveness. The project is ongoing, another long-term relationship, and Qantas has started investigating implementation of the flight planning software into active flights. Of course, we want to do even more and do it better. In our new strategic plan for 2016 to 2020, we're establishing a range of initiatives at the university to foster greater partnership and more effective research translation and commercialization, drawing on some of the best international practice. For example, we're establishing a new Centre for Translational Research to be launched in 2016, focused on bringing our world-leading research in engineering, medical technology and nanoscience together with industry and commercial partners. 
We've also recently been selected as the host of the new Medical Technologies and Pharmaceutical Industry Growth Centre, which is to be about to be announced by Minister Pine, Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Next April, we're officially opening our new state-of-the-art is Sydney Nanoscience Hub, which is one of the most technologically advanced facilities in the world for conducting science at the nanoscale. This facility will not only become home to our leading research groups in quantum computing, one of which, led by Professor David Riley, is supported by contracts from Microsoft as one of only three such groups in the world, but will also provide our industry partner, partners with extraordinary facilities to use and new opportunities to work further with us. Another key initiative in 2016 will be the establishment of our new Centre for Translational Data Science that aims to build a world-class capacity for data science and machine learning, working in close partnership with industry and government and focused on some of the critical social and economic and technical challenges that Australia faces today. Finally, and returning to my theme about capacity building in relation to the development of our people, we believe that the future of innovation depends crucially on the education of undergraduate and postgraduate students to expose them to and train them in leading edge research skills, but also to give them the opportunity to learn and be motivated by entrepreneurship, spend time during their degrees in industry and community settings, be encouraged to innovate and experiment and to develop a passion for taking their ideas out into the market and the community at large. One important lesson that we've learned um, is the, uh, from some of the leading technology firms is their close engagement with an in interest in the university system around them. They're constantly on the lookout for talent and see research intensive universities as providing an extraordinary research for developing and directing high quality research for their, um, for their industries. As a result in our new education strategy, we'll be offering a vision for undergraduate and postgraduate education that will provide all our students from across the full range of our disciplines with the framework and opportunity to experience more workplace learning, to develop more real world problem solving skills, involving more um, opportunities to participate in interdisciplinary and collaborative projects, as well as the broad education and training that ensures that they will remain adaptable and resilient lifelong learners and responsible global citizens. We want even more University of Sydney students to be starting their own companies, translating their ideas into new products and technologies, and carrying the spirit of entrepreneurship into whatever field they choose to enter. Again, there are things we're building on. For example, our student-led startup accelerator Incubator, Incubate, currently sponsored by Lenovo, supports a community of student entrepreneurs on campus providing professional mentoring and accelerating the growth of high potential startups. Pod plants, a novel aeroponic system to grow plants by suspending them in a nutrient laden mist, is one example of a company that's grown out of the incubate program. Pod plants was subsequently invited to become a portfolio company with the Australian Technology Park Innovation Incubator located close to the university and which is a joint venture between us and a number of other Australian universities. That's a good example of our attempt to help build the kind of innovation ecosystem that we find in the United States and elsewhere. The, United, the University of Sydney is a 25% shareholder in ATP Innovations, um, which was crowned 2014 Incubator of the Year at the MBIA International Conference on Business Incubation and Global Awards in New Orleans. ATP Innovations has a portfolio of over 70 companies, a number of which were spun out of the university, including Elastigen, which won the New South Wales Medical Device Funding Award um, for focusing on um, treatments for skin and tissue repair, and BreatheWell, which is currently trialling a product that uses biofeedback to obtain better image quality and clinical outcomes from radiotherapy. The Sydney Basin is not Silicon Valley, but the same lessons apply. You've got to have long-term close, sustainable relationships with industry partners. You've got to make sure that your research agenda and their problems are closely aligned. You've got to make sure that both the industry partners understands what makes a university researcher get out of bed in the morning and that university researchers understand the culture of their industry partners. But you've also got to make sure that you are educating students 
in a way that is attractive to your industry partners and give students the opportunity to participate in real world problem solving to develop a nose for the commercial while they are at, uni at university and at the same time develop their core intellectual skill. We are by good fortune at a point in which governments and industry are for their part, part realizing the importance of such um, partnerships to sustainable economy. The same is true here in India with its outstanding tradition of research and education and its enormous industrial capacity. We look forward to working with university and industrial partners in this country too to ensure that the best ideas and most talented students and researchers can work together for the future of our region. Thank you.